ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back Brad Barons. Thanks for coming back. So, uh, who's been on the floor today? Raise your hand if you've been on the floor. How's it going? Let's give a shout out for, is the floor good? Shout it out. All right. Okay, what's the best, what's the best booth? Okay, I gotta say, there's a lot of missed, there's a big missed marketing opportunity just then. All right, somebody should have had the guts to shout out their name. Um, I'm so happy that you're all here. We have a real treat for you. Guy Kawasaki is the uh, former chief evangelist for Apple. He is the author of The Art of the Start. He's most recently the art of the book Enchantment, which I read cover to cover and, and found, in fact, enchanting. Uh, it, he manages to be both extraordinarily eloquent and wise and compelling all at the same time. So we're very lucky to have him. Uh, he's going to be joining us on stage in one moment. Come on in. Let's get going. Let's give a big round warm of applause for Guy Kawasaki. <laughs> Almost forgot. <laughs> and here he is. I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Guy Kawasaki, and I'm going to talk to you today about uh, being enchanting. And as all advertising, sales, and marketing people, and PR people, uh, that is a very necessary skill. So uh, that was a brief biography of, or an introduction of me, so let me give you a little bit more detail. Um, I worked for Apple from 1983 to 1987. I was Apple's second software evangelist. Uh, how many of you use Macintoshes in this room? Oh, that's very, very pleasant. Uh, it, it used to be that you asked that question and no one would raise their hands. And that was really the, the wonder years, as in I wonder when anybody will ever use Macintoshes. Um, I worked for Apple from 83 to 87 in the Macintosh division, which meant that I worked for Steve Jobs, essentially. That was a very interesting experience, using the word interesting loosely. Uh, the Macintosh division was arguably the greatest collection of egomaniacs in the history of Silicon Valley. And uh, that's saying a lot. Uh, we probably held that record for 20 years. Uh, Google broke that record, but you know, we held it for a good couple decades. Um, because we worked for Steve, unlike any other part of Apple, we had very special rules, unlimited supplies of Odwalla orange juice, $2 a bottle. Uh, we had a great travel policy which was that we could travel first class for any flight over two hours. And the key to this travel policy is, when does the two hours begin? And in my uh, interpretation of that rule, the two hours begins at the moment you leave your apartment. So I lived in Los Altos, and I flew out of uh, SFO. So that, that was like a 45-minute drive right there. So basically, I flew first class from San Francisco to Monterey. Uh, I had a great time. Uh, the company, Apple, back then had two divisions, really. Apple II, which was making all the money, and the Macintosh division, which wasn't shipping, so it was spending all the money. Uh, back then, if you looked at the Apple P and L, the P was Apple II, the L was Macintosh. And uh, we were such bad people, uh, believe it or not, we would not let Apple people, Apple II people, into our building. And so if you think about that, we were not letting them into a building they were paying for which uh, quite justifiably upset them. So they came up with this great joke about the Macintosh division, which is how many Macintosh division employees does it take to screw in a light bulb? The answer is one. The Macintosh division employee holds up the light bulb and expects the universe to revolve around him. Uh, and because I'm in uh, such a friendly audience here, I'll tell you the Microsoft version of this joke. But I'm, look I'm struggling here. I'm looking for a sign that shows who are the sponsors, because this could have, this could have, it, where? You're going to oh, okay. You're okay. Okay, okay. So the Microsoft version of this joke is how many Microsoft employees does it take to screw the light bulb? The answer is none because Steve Ballmer has declared darkness the new standard. <laughs> um, after working in the Mac division, I started several software companies. I actually returned to Apple in 1995 as Apple's chief evangelist. Uh, then my job was to make sure that the Macintosh cult uh, remained happy and active. And then I left to start uh, Garage Technology Ventures, an early stage VC firm where I am still today. Uh, this speech, however, is nothing to do with venture capital, uh, a little bit to do with Apple, and it is about enchantment. Um, my first job out of college was working in a jewelry manufacturer, believe it or not. I literally schlepped diamonds uh, around the world. 
And I learned a lot about selling and enchantment there because the jewelry business is fundamentally a business about enchantment. After that, as you heard, I was a software evangelist for Apple. And that was the story of enchanting people to write software for, at the time, a platform that had no install base, lousy tools, uh, no other software, no hard disk, no color. You know, it was a piece of crap, but it was a revolutionary piece of crap. And uh, it took a lot of enchantment to make that work. Uh, subsequently, I became great fans of the work of Dale Carnegie, How to Win Friends and Influence People, as well as a psychologist, a social psychologist named Robert Cialdini out of Arizona, who wrote a great book about influence and persuasion. So I wanted to write a book about influence and persuasion and wooing, uh, but I wanted to take it to the next step, to go from engagement, if you will, to enchantment, where you actually delight people. Just as Tom Peters, uh, how many of you have not heard of Tom Peters and In Search of Excellence? Because like, I spoke the other day to an audience, and like 75% of the audience never heard of Tom Peters and In Search of Excellence, which is kind of scary. So anyway, Tom Peters took us from an expectation of business of surviving to an expectation for business of excellence. And I want to take us from an expectation of engagement to enchantment. Uh, before I start, one more piece of information about my speeches. I've been in the tech business for about 30 years now, so I've watched many, many high-tech CEOs speak. And I'll tell you, there are two key points about high-tech speakers. First, they pretty much all suck as speakers. <laughs> really, they, they are amazingly bad as speakers. And the second thing is, they go long. They go longer than their allotment. And that is a bad combination. You know, if, you're, if you suck and you're short, it's OK. <laughs> and if you're great and you go long, it's OK. But if you suck and you go long, it's like being stupid and arrogant. It's like being slow and hard to use, you know? And so what I did is, because I never wanted to be accused of this, I embrace the top 10 format. So all my speeches are in the top 10 format, and this one will be today too. And the reason why I use the top 10 format is in case you think I suck, at least you know approximately how much longer I'll <laughs> suck because I have 10 parts to this speech. So this is the top 10 format of how to be an enchanting person, how to change people's hearts, minds, and actions. Uh, as a room full of marketing people and advertising people, um, I am speaking to you. This is all about marketing and advertising. So um, the first thing you have to do, believe it or not, is very fundamental. You have to achieve likability. You know, I just noticed something. Uh, those of you who are taking pictures of the slides, uh, don't panic. I'm not going to pull an RIAA on you. Um, <laughs> I'm telling you that at the end of this presentation, I'm going to give you an email address where we will send you PDFs of this presentation. So you don't need to take a picture of every slide. You're going to get it in a beautiful PDF. And if you're a Macintosh user, you'll just double click and it'll open. <laughs> <laughs> and if you're a Windows user, you're on your own. I mean, OK, so ask yourself, have you ever been enchanted by someone you did not like? Highly unlikely. You know, if you want to enchant people, you have to be likable. So let me give you the basics of likability. The start of likability is you have to have a great smile. A great smile, not a Pan Am smile. Second data point I learned about a week ago, I asked the audience, how many of you have not heard of Pan Am? And about 75% of that audience said, yeah, we don't know who Tom Peters is. We don't know who Pan Am is. Talk about being an irrelevant, un unenchanting speaker. Jesus. So Pan Am smile. You know, truly, is this flight, oh, truly, truly is that flight attendant smiling? Is she glad to see those customers? I don't think so. This smile is only using one set of muscles, the jaw muscles. She's kind of grinning. Okay? If you want a great smile, an enchanting smile, it's called a Duchenne smile. And a Duchenne smile uses two sets of muscles, the eyes and the jaw. Great smiles. Great smiles create crow's feet. Just think of all the money I just saved you. No more Botox, no more plastic surgery. You want crow's feet. 
Crow's feet is good, or crow's feet are good. I've never figured out if it's are or is. Crow's feet is good. You want crow's feet. It shows a genuine smile. And uh, this picture, these people, they, they're like, you know, cool it on the iMag here for a second. So this is a picture of Mary Smith. How many of you know Mary Smith? Facebook person, expert in social media. So this is my friend Mary Smith. And I sent her an email. I said, Mary, I've got good news for you and bad news for you. The good news is you will be in all my enchantment speeches. I give this speech 50 to 75 times a year. I reach tens of thousands of people. I'm going to tell many people about you and your social media and Facebook skills. That's the good news. The bad news is the reason why you're in my speech is you really have pronounced crow's feet. <laughs> Being the Facebook social media good person she is, she understood. You want a Mar Mary Smith Duchenne smile, two sets of muscles. The next thing is, how do you dress? Essentially, you want to dress for a tie. You want to roughly equal your audience. So there are other concepts of how to dress. First, you could dress beneath your audience, where you know your audience will be in a suit and tie and business power suits. But you show up in sneakers, jeans, and a t-shirt just because you can. You're showing that you don't respect the audience. The other way to dress is to overdress. This is to dress beyond your audience because you want to show that you have more power, you have more money, you have better taste. This also is not enchanting. What you want to do is dress for a tie, dress to say we are peers. Now, you might ask, OK, guys, so why are you wearing an Aloha shirt? Well, I'll tell you that, first of all, just looking at my entire combination here, there's a lot of thought here to what, how I, what I wore today. So starting at the bottom, I'm wearing uh, boots that I bought in Austin. They are black ostrich. So that is supposed to dress for the cool people in the audience who would wear black ostrich boots. Uh, the jeans are for the geeks in the audience, because that's all geeks ever wear. And this Aloha shirt is an Ann Namba Aloha shirt. And if you're anybody from Hawaii here? So have you ever heard of Ann Namba? Yeah? So Ann Namba is the Aloha shirt person in Hawaii, not, not Hilo Hattie, Ann Namba. So uh, I'm trying to dress to tie three kinds of constituencies <laughs> here. It's not that easy when you speak to this kind of group. The point is to dress equally to your audience, not above, not below. And the last thing for you science and math majors is you need the perfect handshake. And as a service to you, I'm providing you the perfect mathematical formula for this handshake. It has to do with the length of your eye contact, your verbal greeting, your Duchenne smile, the firmness of your grip, the dryness and smoothness of your hand, the amount of vigor, and the length of two to three seconds. That is the formula for the perfect handshake. You don't need to memorize it. It's in the book. That's the perfect handshake. Uh, by the way, uh, this perfect handshake was calculated or, or created by people at the University of Manchester. So if you're from the United Kingdom, it is your tax dollars <laughs> that created this perfect formula. We Americans, we like to save our tax dollars to you know, bomb other countries. So uh, that is the perfect handshake. So that's likability, OK? Great smile, Duchenne smile, dressing as peers, and the perfect handshake, the fundamentals of likability. Now, you can be likable, but not trustworthy. Lots of people like celebrities. You could like Charlie Sheen, but not trust Charlie Sheen, for example. So the next step is to be trustworthy. The starting point of trustworthiness is the order. What happens first? Do you trust your customers so they trust you? or? Do you wait for your customers tr to trust you? Then you'll trust them. This is not a chicken or egg question. There is a definite order. You have to trust people before they will trust you. Here are three great examples. Amazon. You can buy a Kindle ebook, and you have up to five days to return the ebook. Many people could read an ebook in five days. They trust you enough to let you return it after five days or up to five days. Zappos. Zappos is arguably the great example of trustworthiness in the digital world, right? So if Tony Shea had said to me, guys, so here's our business model. We're going to enable women to buy shoes without looking at them and trying them on. 
I would have said, Tony, you are crazy. There's no woman in the world who's going to buy some Jimmy Choo's shoes without trying them on and looking at them. But you know what? Obviously, Zappos has been successful. And it's because women trust Zappos. And why do women trust Zappos? Because you can get the shoe, and if you don't like it, you can return it, and Zappos will pay shipment the other way. They pay shipping both ways. They trusted women, so women trusted Zappos. And finally, there is the classic example of Nordstrom, the retailer that truly trusts its customers. Three examples, organizations that trusted people, so people trust it. Step one is trust others. Step two is about baking versus eating. An eater sees a pie and says, ah, limited pie. I have to eat as much of the pie as possible. What I eat, somebody else doesn't eat. What somebody else eats, I don't eat. It is a land grab. A baker, by contrast, looks at the world very differently. A baker says, I can bake more pies. I can bake bigger pies. The rising tide can float all boats. People who are bakers are trustworthy. They do not see the world as a zero-sum game. And the third quality is to always default to a yes attitude. That is, when you meet people, if you want to be a world-class networker, a world-class schmoozer, always be thinking, how can I help the person that I just met? Many people are asking, how can I get something from the person I just met? If you want to be trustworthy, default to yes. Whatever they ask me, I will do. Now, you may ask, well, what happens? This is a dangerous practice. And I will tell you, in three decades of doing this, I can count on one hand the number of times where I was asked something unreasonable. And arguably, in those, are, in those circumstances, the people who are asking you to do something unreasonable are not worth enchanting. Default to yes. The next step is to actually get ready with your product, your service, yourself. Here's how you get ready. First, this is a mental framework for what defines great products and great services. They are deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant. Let us go through each one of those. Deep products and services have lots of features. They do lots of things. Deep functionality. As you come up the power curve, you will see that they have anticipated what you will need to do. Deep products. Intelligent products. When you look at this product, you say, wow, somebody figured out my pain. Somebody has articulated, figured out, and solved my pain, perhaps even before I could have. A great example of this is by Ford. Anybody work for Ford in this audience? OK, so I have two teenage boys, 15 and 17. One is in the permit pro Do you work for Ford? No. Well, one is 15 and one is 17. So one has a license and one is about to get a license. Now, I love cars. And, and Ford has a car that I am just dying to buy. It's a Mustang, specifically a GT500 Shelby Mustang. If you knew anything about GT500 Shelby Mustangs, you'd understand that it has 550 horsepower. It's roughly the equivalent of 10 Priuses, OK? <laughs> just not only in power, also in pollution. So I, I just love this car, 0 to 60 in about 4 seconds. This is a badass Mustang. This is for, you know, a, a, an Asian man going through midlife crisis. This is perfect. <laughs> so I want to buy this Mustang, but I know that there's going to be some circumstance where my kids are going to be driving that car. And I think it is socially irresponsible for me to let my kids drive a car with 550 horsepower. So I'm in this conundrum, you know. Yeah, you could buy the Mustang, and for a while, it'll be only your car. But inevitably, there's going to be some situation where they're going to drive it. And God help the people who live in Menlo Park when my kids <laughs> are driving this car. But then I figured out Ford has this very intelligent product called the MyKey. And the MyKey does many things. But the MyKey that I care about does one thing really well, which is you can program the top speed of the car into the key. So I could give my boys the key to the Mustang programmed to a maximum of 55 miles an hour. <laughs> now, if that's not an intelligent product, I don't know what is. Great products are also complete. It means that when you have a great product, it's not just the software. It's the software, the enhancements, it's the app developers, it's the online documentation, 
it's the PDFs, it's the support structure, it's the conferences. That's what makes something great. Empowering products make you feel creative, productive, that you're doing something special. You're not fighting the product. And finally, elegance is about user interface. Somebody cared about the user interface. They didn't just slap chips together. So in preparation, ask yourself, is our product, is our service, is our company, are you personally deep, intelligent, complete, empowering, and elegant? The next thing you need to do is figure out a nice, short, sweet, and swallowable description of what you do. Short, sweet, and swallowable. This is an ad created by a firm in New York called Corey K. Right after 9-11, he was the uh, advertising agency for the Metropolitan Transportation System of New York, and they started putting up these posters. If you see something, say something. How short, sweet, and swallowable is that? You know, I'm talking about a mantra, two or three words, not mission statements. How many of you have mission statements in this audience? Come on, raise your hands. I know. It's all the people who use Windows. Yeah. So, <laughs> so let's just talk about mission statements. Mission statements are typically 50 words long, right? And the way you got this mission statement is you went to the corporate off-site. At this off-site, which was held at a golf resort, because there's high correlation, golf course to mission statement. It's two-day off-site. Two-day off-site, you had to hire an outside meeting facilitator because no one on your executive team could lead. If there was someone who could lead, you wouldn't need the off-site to do the mission statement. <laughs> so you hire, you hire this facilitator. Typically, it's a woman. So her name is Moonbeam. Moonbeam <laughs> drives a Prius, is aghast at the concept of a Mustang. Uh, vegetarian, Birkenstocks, all the good stuff. She's also a Lamaze instructor because pushing out a mission statement is just like pushing out a baby. Same concept. So you have a two-day off-site. The first day, you form cross-functional teams with the people you can't stand. <laughs> you climb ropes together. You fall into each other's arms. Hallelujah. Now you're kumbaya. Now you like all these people in this company. The next day, you create this mission statement. And it's 50 people in the room. You each gave up two, uh, two days of your life. You figure, ha, huh, I'm entitled to give one word into the mission statement. So now it's 50-word mission statement. And it's going to be good for the customers, the employees, the shareholders. And if you're in California, you have to include the whales and the dolphins. Right? And you come up with a 50-mission word statement. I think you should do it short, sweet, and swallowable. Three, four, five words, two words, mantra. For eBay, democratize commerce. You want to sell stuff online? Democratize commerce, eBay store. Target, or Target as we call it in Menlo Park. At Target, it is about the democratization of design. Nike, just do it as their slogan. What does Nike stand for? Authentic athletic performance. Short, sweet, or swallow and swallowable. Next item, conduct a pre-mortem. In preparation for launch, instead of asking the people, OK, anybody have any problems? Don't expect anybody to answer that question. Because by answering that question, you, t you paint a target on yourself. If you're the software person and you say, well, you know, we think the marketing sucks, well, you just created an enemy in marketing. Right? You're seen as a naysayer, a negative player. You're not part of a team, you know, because you're bringing up problems. The other alternative is you wait till after the product fails. Then you do a post-mortem. And after it fails, you figure out why did it die. The problem with that is, A, it's too late. And B, the, problem who, the people who created the problem are probably gone. So what I want you to do is conduct a pre-mortem, which is to say to the group, let's pretend we failed. Let's come up with all the reasons why we might fail. Software is buggy. Marketing is unsophisticated. Salesforce isn't properly trained. Microsoft enters the market with a competitive product and gives it away for free. Whatever, right? Come up with all these reasons, then let's go down through the list and try to eliminate all the reasons. Conduct a pre-mortem to avoid a post-mortem. Next thing you need to do is launch. In the launch, the first key point is tell a story. When you or your clients launch something, tell a story how the two of you were in a garage one day and you decided, why is it that the only people who have computers are universities, banks, large companies? Why is that? There must be a better way. Let's create a personal computer. So we went out and we decided we would build motherboards and we would enter the market and create 
personal computers. What a great story. Or that your girlfriend wanted to sell her collection of Pez dispensers on the internet and there was no way to do it. So I created eBay. It's a made up story, but that's the story eBay tells. Great story. Tell those kinds of stories. Not about paradigm shifting, curve jumping, revolutionary products and services, using all the acronyms of your industry. Tell a story about why the two of you, the three of you, your company created this product or service. The next point is to plant many seeds. I believe there are two kinds of marketing in the world. One is top down. In the top down theory, you identify the A-listers, the oracles, the people who make a product or service. They work for the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Wired. You suck up to them. If you don't like to do the sucking up, you hire a PR firm to do the sucking up for you. And you pay them 15,000 bucks a month, then they assign Oriental Art History from Wellesley to do it for you. OK. So now, you suck up to them. Hopefully they review your product. Hopefully they like your product. Then they tell the hoi polloi, the great unwashed masses, we have decided. Lotus 1, 2, 3 is a great product. Use Lotus. Use Lotus. Just trust us. We are the oracles. That's marketing 1.0. Marketing 2.0 is a different world. I think the world has been flattened, if not inverted. It's been flattened and inverted by social media, by blogs, Facebook, and Twitter. And now, Nobody's are the new somebodies. Nobody's make new products. Nobody's make things successful. And then the somebodies, the A-listers, have to write about you. The reason why Twitter is successful is not because five years ago somebody at the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, Wired, or CNET said that Twitter was the, f the future of personal communication. Find me an article that's five years old where some A-list blogger said, this is the future. People will be able to send 140 character messages and tell the world that their cat rolled over, <laughs> right? And right now, it, yes, it is about people telling people that the cat rolled over. But someday, it's going to bring down entire governments. That's the future of Twitter. Show me an article five years old that said that. It is because of what I call Lonely Boy 15. <laughs> Lonely Boy 15 with his 25 followers who you could never identify, never find. That's what's making products successful. You need to find a bunch of Lonely Boy 15s. And if enough Lonely Boy 15s embrace you, then guess what? You will be successful. You will be a Twitter. And then guess what? The A-listers have to carry, cover you. The problem is it's very hard to find these Lonely Boy 15s. That's why you have to plant many seeds. Get your product out there. I'm not telling you to ignore the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, but I am telling you just focusing on them is a mistake today because of the inversion of the marketing pyramid. The next thing is to use salient points. On the left side, you see how the industry likes to talk about stuff. On the right side, you see what people really care about. Miles per gallon? Not really. It's yearly cost. If you're a not-for-profit, is it the dollars you bring in? That's not really the salient point. The salient point is how many months of food does $20 buy? What is the salient point? How long you can feed a family? And in gadgets, is it gigabytes? Do you wake up in the morning saying, I got to get to the Apple store. I need a 64 gigabyte iPhone. I need a 64 gigabyte iPad. I don't think so. You're thinking in terms of songs and movies and apps. Use salient points. Use the stuff in the right column. The fifth point is to overcome resistance. I sure hope this clock is wrong, because this clock says 12 minutes and 17 seconds, and I'm halfway through, and I cannot finish in 12 minutes and 17 seconds. So I'm apologizing in advance to whoever is following me in this room, because I'm going to run long. At least I know that already. Go long, you think? Because you don't suck. Can I quote you yet? Can I quote you? Somebody tweet that. Somebody said, guy doesn't suck. So. This is a picture of the Nintendo family computer system. When it was about to introduce this system, it had a problem. Retailers would not stock games. They, the game business had burnt itself out in the mid-70s. So it did something very clever. It added the robot to the computer gaming system and didn't call it a gaming system. It called it a toy specifically an electronic toy and an educational toy. So now retailers stocked it because it wasn't a game, it was a toy. And kids asked for it, and they asked for it as an educational toy. I will learn robotics, mom. 
if you buy me this. Ah, excuse me. Sorry, that's a bad thing. If you're using a countryman and you sneeze, there's not much you can do about that. Another way to overcome resistance, social proof. You know when the iPod first came out, you saw people with white earbuds. And after a while, you figured out, ah, white earbud equals iPod. There sure are a lot of people with white earbuds. So eventually, you bought one, and now there were more white earbuds. And so there are more and more white earbuds, so then there are more and more people buying iPods, so there are more and more people buying, having white earbuds, and it just became this upward spiral. <laughs> Provide social proof. Show people. Enable people, your clients, yourselves, to show that your product is being embraced. Provide social proof. The next thing is to find the bright spot. This depicts a condition in Vietnam, horrible malnutrition, person went to Vietnam, and rather than focusing on the problems, he found a bright spot. The bright spot was that in every village, there was usually a family or two that had much healthier children. So he asked them, well, you know, what do you do differently? And he found they did something very simple. They added shrimps and crabs from the rice patties to the meals of their kids. That was the only difference. There was a bright spot. And he focused on the bright spot. Rather than trying to overcome resistance to the bad spots, he found the thing that was working. Fast forward here. With Macintosh, 1983 to 1990, what was the bright spot? It sure as hell was not word processing, spreadsheet, and database. We were zero for three there. The bright spot was PageMaker. PageMaker was this bright spot that created this really bright spot called desktop publishing. And desktop publishing saved Apple. If it wasn't for desktop publishing and PageMaker, there would be no Apple today. All of our phones would be different. We would have real keyboards. The battery would last for more than a day. We would be using better carriers. It would be a different world. Okay? All this PageMaker was a gift from God to Apple Computer. It saved Apple. I believe in God. As a Macintosh user, you have to believe in God. One of the reasons why I believe in God is there is no other explanation for Apple's continued survival than the existence of a benevolent God. <laughs> Point here, find the bright spot. The next thing is to enchant all the influencers. In a family situation, many people assume it's the father who makes the call. That's not such a good assumption. It could be the mother. It could be the sister-in-law. In an Asian family, it could be the older generation, the grandfather. In my personal family, it is the daughter. <laughs> the daughter is who matters in my family. If you enchant and influence my daughter, you got me. No problem. The point here is don't assume who's making the decision. Enchant them all. In a business setting, as a venture capitalist, we often meet with companies, young companies, and they want us to introduce them to CIO, CTO, CXO level people of big companies. The thinking is high level people, they have all the brains and all the power, they make the decision, they can enforce top down adoption of our product or service. Guy, would you introduce me to Jeff Bezos so that I can tell him how he should throw out all the servers at Amazon and use the servers that we have not yet invented but we're trying to raise $2 million to. <laughs> So you know what? Other than the organizations represented in this organization, the higher you go in most companies, the thinner the air. And guess what happens when air thins out? It's harder and harder to support intelligent life. <laughs> so if you try to deal with only the tops of most organizations, inevitably you'll be dealing with the dumbest people because that's the least air. You need to enchant all the influencers. That occurs at the middles and the bottoms of organizations. The sixth thing is to endure. This is a picture of the Grateful Dead. They have endured for five decades. One of the reasons why they've endured is because, believe it or not, they have a section at every Grateful Dead concert for tapers, not that there's taping anymore. And these tapers, this section is to encourage people to record the music, to distribute it for non-commercial use. Have you heard of many groups that encourages the spread of its music? I don't think so. How many concerts have you gone to at HP Pavilion with a section that says, for you to record the concert? I don't think so. One way to endure is to ensure that there are more evangelists for you, like the Grateful Dead. Another way, don't depend on money. Money is typically the enemy of enchantment. If you have to use money to enchant people, it will blow up on you, it will be short term, and it will be narrow and shallow. Don't use money. 
It's not the affiliate fee. It's not the commission. Make sure people love your product. I'm not saying you shouldn't pay people, but if it's only the money, it's not enchantment. Second thing is to invoke reciprocation. This carpet depicts the war between Italy and Ethiopia. Italy invaded Ethiopia in the 1930s. When that happened, the people of Mexico collected money and sent money to the people of Ethiopia to help finance the war. Ninety years later, there was an earthquake in Mexico. And even though the people in Ethiopia were undergoing a terrific famine, they collected money and gave money to Mexico. A much poorer country, Ethiopia, was giving money to the people of Mexico because 90 years earlier, the people of Mexico helped the people of Ethiopia. Similar thing happened in 9-11. Right after the Civil War, the people of Charleston were using bucket brigades to fight fires. The people of New York found this out. The people of New York donated money to buy the people of Charleston a fire truck. The first boat sank. They had to buy the people of Charleston a second fire truck. Okay, 150 years later, 9-11, the people of Charleston, honoring a vow that was made 150 years earlier, bought the people of New York a fire truck because they had vowed that when New York needed its help, they would come through 150 years later. Two power tips about reciprocation. When you do something for somebody and they thank you, the optimal response for you is not you're welcome. The optimal response is, I know you would do the same for me. You're telling the person, I think you're honorable, I think you're a good person. I know you would do the same for me. What you're also telling the person is, I know you will do the same for me. <laughs> Very powerful response. That's advice from Robert Cialdini. Second power tip about reciprocation. Enable people to reciprocate. Enable people to pay you back. Don't let people off the hook because you think you let them off the hook, but they still carry the burden. You should provide them a way to pay you back. That clears the decks, and then you can do more things for each person. For all you know, that person is hesitating to ask you because she or he already owes you something, and you might be perfectly willing to do more things. Let that person pay you back. You know, we have a neighbor, and my neighbor's kids are always at our house. They're eating at our house. We take them to hockey games, a lot of stuff. And so, and I love to play hockey. And, but my wife has a very busy life, and so sometimes she's at a social event or a, a fundraising event, and it's at night, and it's the night I want to play hockey, and I say, all right, don't worry, you know, we have four kids, two teenagers and two little kids. So, you know, you might ask, well, why don't you just have the two older boys watch the two younger kids? And, you know, if you think about that for a second, I wouldn't give my Mustang to the two older kids. Why would I give my two younger kids to the two older kids, right? Because surely I love my kids more than the Mustang. So what I do is I say, oh, you know, let's just call up Corby because Corby can watch our two kids. You can go to your dinner and I can go play hockey. And my wife says, no, you shouldn't do that because Corby has her own two kids. She's very busy. And I say, no, you're wrong. You should enable Corby to pay us back. It's better for her. It's better for you. You have peace of mind and I get to play hockey. <laughs> Reciprocation. Next thing is to build an ecosystem, to build a total system completeness. When you have all these parties pulling for you, you will endure. Think of all the power of Apple having all those iOS developers, right? Or if you're Google, the Android developers that builds this ecosystem, build an ecosystem. The seventh thing is to learn how to truly pitch and present. If you want to enchant people, you need to be able to present. First thing is customize the introduction. Customize the introduction means that when you first start off the speech, which ironic, I did not do this, this today because I am on the shut, such a short time frame here. Customize the introduction means show that there's some kind of connection between you and the audience. In this case, this is a picture of my LG washer and dryer. It's because I was in Brazil and I was speaking to the Latin American management of LG. However, stupid me, I was in Brazil when I figured out, ah, oh, you know, you have an LG washer and dryer. You should have taken a picture and showed these LG people that you actually have LG products. I, uh, that's my washer on the left side. It's the washer that has a steam cycle. That's why I bought it. I have never used that steam cycle, but I think it's so cool that a washer has a steam cycle. 
So anyway, I'm in Rio, and I, and I figure out, God, it would be so great to have a picture of my washer and dryer. I'll just send a text message to my two older boys. You know, the two older boys that I bought iOS 4s for, you know? Okay, so let's have a little reciprocation here, boys. I bought you iPhones. How about you take some pictures for me? So a, a while goes by, and I needed it right away, and uh, no pictures. So I send a text message to my older son, Nick, and he tells me that his younger brother, Noah, has you know, just taken the pictures and sent it to me. This is the series of text messages. So first is my message to my son. You know, Nick, did you get my text messages? Nick responds with Noah, his younger brother, said he did. Um, by the way, since you're talking to LG, can you get us some TVs? And then you see my response because there's reciprocation and there's also stupidity. So I said, I doubt it. So he figured that, well, I'm talking to LG, and, you know, he's tired of playing Call of Duty and Halo on this 26-inch analog TV, and he wants a 60-inch high-definition, thin plasma display TV. Why, don't, why doesn't Dad just ask him for an LG TV? Customize the introduction. If you know you're speaking to LG, show your LG product or service. I also, when I speak in foreign countries, I go a day early to travel and to show that I'm not some ugly American just zooming in and zooming out. I try to show that I have embraced their culture and seen their culture and, you know, doing Andrew Zimmer and Bizarre Foods kind of thing. So I'll show you some pictures. Uh, this is a picture that I used when I spoke in Moscow. This is me checking out, you know, the Russians have big balls, basically. Um, <laughs> This is another picture. Uh, this is when I went to Scotland. Uh, this is, I don't know how you pronounce it, haggis, haggis, haggis. I don't know how people can eat this, but you know, listen, I'm from Hawaii. I eat poi. That probably would disgust them as much. So this is Crombie's in Edinburgh. If you ever get to Scotland, this is the place to go. I saw, I learned about this watching Bizarre Foods with Andrew Zimmerman. I love that show. And the, finally, uh, you know, my last name is Kawasaki. So uh, when I was in Mumbai, I said, oh, uh, here's a picture of two sacred cows. Um, and if you, that woman, that Indian woman who's behind the cow there, she's just cracking up. She's just like, what is this stupid American doing taking a picture with this cow here? So uh, these are three pictures I used to customize an introduction. Next thing you need to know is sell your dream. When you stand up or your clients stand up and you talk about your new product, do not stand up and say, today. I have an iPhone. I'm introducing an iPhone. It's $188 worth of parts. These parts are put together in China at a company where people tend to commit suicide. <laughs> and, and uh, you know, until a few months ago, we're going to stick you with a two-year contract for the worst carrier in America, <laughs> right? That's why you should buy an iPhone. It's $188 worth of parts manufactured in China with a lousy data plan. That's not exactly what he says. He's talking about thinness and beauty and the power of an iPhone. And there's an app for that. And it's all that good stuff. Next thing is the classic 10, 20, 30 rule of PowerPoint. The optimal number of slides in PowerPoint is 10. 10. You'd be lucky to get 10 slides across very well. Now, some of you who are quantitatively oriented and wise asses, you may be thinking, you know, guy, you're a hypocrite because you've used way more than 10 slides already. Well, I have several explanations for you. First of all, you're not me. That's number one. Number two, as you see, I like to use a lot of pictures. So I can't just use slides with bullet points where I click, click, click. I use a lot of pictures. So I have a lot more slides. Next point is you should be able to give those 10 slides in 20 minutes. You may have a one hour meeting, but other than this audience, 95% of the world uses Windows. They need 40 minutes to make it hook up with the projector. Okay? <laughs> so, 10 slides, 20 minutes, and the optimal size font is 30 points. Not 8, 10, or 12. If you use 8, 10, or 12, guess what? You're going to read your slides. You're going to read your slides verbatim. And the audience, two slides into this presentation, is going to figure, ah, this bozo is reading his slides verbatim. I can read silently to myself faster than this bozo can read them to me. I'll just read ahead. Now, if you think this rule is too dogmatic, I'll give you a rule of thumb. Figure out who the oldest person is in the audience. Divide his or her age by two. Pitching to 60-year-olds, 30 points. 50-year-olds, 25 points. VCs are getting younger. Someday you may be raising money from a venture capital firm. Might be 16-year-old VC. At that point, use the eight-point font. God bless you. <laughs>
Until that day, 10 slides, 20 minutes, 30 points. The eighth thing is to use technology, some guidelines for enchanting people with technology. Step one, remove the speed bumps. CAPTCHA. CAPTCHA is a system designed to, to reduce the number of people who sign up for your website. The first word, the first word is hover, no problema. What is the second word? <laughs> the second word, is it Korean, is it simple Chinese, is it complex Chinese, is it hiragana, katakana, is it Farsi, it's Hebrew, guess what? And ironically, this is the great irony, that Hebrew word is what? Obstacle. How perfect is that? How perfect is it? Do you have speed bumps in the adoption of your product or service? Are you asking people to understand Hebrew and type in a Hebrew word and have a Hebrew keyboard? Besides that, there's not many speed bumps there. Second thing is, at the end of the day, I think your social media efforts should combine some element of this. Information, insights, or assistance. It's not about your cat rolling over or the line at Starbucks is long. What's happening? What does this happening mean? How can I get this to happen for me? Information, insights, and assistance. And some guidelines. First of all, you need to engage fast, 24 to 48 hours. I'll be the first to admit, I don't fulfill this. Right now, I have 600 emails to answer. But it is my goal to answer every email within 24 to 48 hours. Second thing is, you engage many people. Not just the person, you know, not just Chris Anderson from Wired Magazine, but Lonely Boy 15, because Lonely Boy 15 could be the person who makes you tip. Right? Most companies send out about, uh, most publishers send out 200 copies of a book for business reviews. We sent out 1,600, eight times the normal amount. If you look, you'll find reviews of enchantment by estheticians. Many beauty bloggers have reviewed this book. God bless them. If every esthetician bought my copy, my book, man, it would be a raging success. Engage many people. Second thing is engage often. Social media is not something you do after everything else is done. Social media today is core. It's core to marketing. Next thing is how to enchant people you work for. Very simple. When they ask you to do something, drop everything and do it. Not pleasant. This slide has never gotten any applause, but it is the God's honest truth. You want to impress your boss. When she asks you to do something, drop everything else and do it. Secondly, prototype fast. If she asks you for a PowerPoint presentation in a week, the next day, show up with a rough draft. This is the rough draft that became this presentation. Okay? Prototype fast. It means you're reacting fast. It also increases the probability that you'll do something good because you got feedback early in the process. And the third thing is to deliver bad news early. You never want to deliver bad news late. Deliver bad news as early as possible. Even better, deliver bad news with a solution. You should never surprise your boss if you want to enchant your boss. How do you enchant people who work for you? Number one step, the work of Daniel Pink in a book called Drive. Three key points to enchanting people who work for you. First, enable them to master new skills. You come to work for me, you will master social media, programming, photography, whatever it is. You will gain new skills by working for me. You'll be working autonomously, independently. I'm not going to be breathing down your neck. And finally, you'll be working towards a higher purpose. We're not just about making a buck. We're about changing the world. Come to work for me. You'll master new skills. You'll be working autonomously towards a higher purpose. Second way to enchant people who work for you is to empower action. To basically say to them, I think you're smart. I think you're good. I empower you to make a decision that's right for our customers. And the third way to enchant someone who works for you is to suck it up. In other words, you are willing to do the dirty work. Think of Mike Rowe on Dirty Jobs. How many of you watch Dirty Jobs? What a great show. What makes micro enchanting? What makes micro enchanting is he is willing to do the dirty jobs, to go to the paint factory, the poi factory. He'll clean out the sewer. He'll take the dead rats out of your attic. He'll change the power lines, you know, with the high tension power lines. He'll go to Hawaii and he'll clean the outside of a skyscraper. Think of micro. You want to be an enchanting boss? Think of micro. You are willing to suck it up. 
You never ask your employee to do something that you yourself would not do. And now I'm negative three minutes and 31 seconds, but what are they going to do? Not invite me back next year? <laughs> so, so, I've got to tell you one last marketing story. You'll appreciate this. So, I ran a crowdsource contest for the cover of my book. And this is, the, this is the one that I picked as the winner. I showed this to my publisher. My publisher said, no way. No blue morpho butterfly on the cover or on a red cover. No man would buy this book. This, this cover is too self-help, too airy-fairy, too woo-woo, too Marin County, too Boulder, Colorado, too multiple lives of Shirley MacLaine, too crystals, too whatever. No way. I was crushed. I really love the concept of the metamorphosis, the, the metaphor of a butterfly. So I thought, I'm Japanese. Guess what? We have this thing in my heritage called origami. Well, not, not that I didn't know anything about origami, but <laughs> I can use Google. So I, I Google origami butterfly. And I come up with this great butterfly. This is called the Alexander Swallowtail. It's made by a guy named Michael LaFosse. Michael LaFosse is to origami what Wayne Gretzky is to hockey. OK, so he is the man when it comes to origami. So I contacted him. I said, you know, Michael, I need a, I need a butterfly. And it cannot be a warm, fuzzy, woo-woo, feminine butterfly. It has to be this badass butterfly. <laughs> Imagine. Imagine if a butterfly mated with a B-1 stealth bomber. That's, that's the kind of butterfly I need. And so he created this butterfly, which is actually this butterfly. So this butterfly is the Kawasaki Swallowtail. He made it just for me for the cover. And this Kawasaki Swallowtail, now ask yourself, have you heard of the Gate Swallowtail, the Zuckerberg Swallowtail, <laughs> the William Swallowtail, the Job Swallowtail, the Ellison Swallowtail? Huh? None, none. None, nobody. I have arrived. Cross this off the bucket list. <laughs> I have a butterfly named after me. This is the story of the cover of this book. I thought as marketing people, you would appreciate that. Finally, this slide. I, this is my second to the last slide. This is a picture of a cover after I've signed it. And I just wanted to explain several things to you. We're going to do a signing after this. <sighs> I need to tell you what this says. Because my writing is progressively getting worse and worse. I'm going to sign it, resisting you is futile. Okay? Because I want you to hold this book up proudly in public. And I want you to show people that I think you are irresistible. <laughs> the reason why I sign it on the outside is twofold. One is it is much faster. <laughs> Honestly. Secondly, the whole purpose of getting a book signed is to show off that you met the author. So why would you sign it on the inside? It would be like buying a Ferrari in white. <laughs> you know? If you're going to go for it, go for it. And so it says resisting is futile. And one more reason why I want to tell you what it says is because I had a previous book called The Art of the Start. And I used to sign the book, Kick Butt. Until one day, a lady who I signed it for came up to me after I signed her book and said, Guy, why did you sign my book, Nice Butt? <laughs> And without batting an eyelash, I said, because it's true. <laughs> but so I just want you to know that this says resisting. Or she could have said, why'd you sign my book, Lick Butt? That would have been worse. But <laughs> resisting you is futile. That's how I'm going to sign your book. One more thing. Tomorrow, I'm doing a session with Nancy Duarte of Duarte Design. And we're going to take two PowerPoint presentations from, contributed from the audience and critique it. So that's tomorrow at 10.30 if you want to do that and see how we critique, butter, critique presentations. And this truly is my last slide, 7 minutes and 35 seconds too long. The slides are created by a woman named Anna Frazal, a good Brazilian woman, lives in San Francisco. She creates great presentations. You saw what I presented her, text. This is what she came up with. And finally, if you want copies of this presentation, just send an email to gina at garage.com. We'll be happy to send you one. And so that in slightly over my time by eight minutes. That is how you enchant people. You start with the basis of likability and trustworthiness and great product. If you want anchor points, you want the likability of Richard Branson. When I first met Richard Branson in Moscow, right after I saw the big balls, 
Oh, you're pulling me off, really. No, He's I'm getting not. serious now. So when I met Richard Branson, he asked me, Guy, do you fly Virgin? I said, no, Richard, I hate to tell you I don't fly Virgin because I'm a global services account at United, at the highest level of United. I can't jeopardize that. And in real time, he just got down on his knees and he started polishing my shoes with his coat jacket. And that's the day I started flying Virgin America. <laughs> so you want the likability of Virgin America, you want the trustworthiness of Zappos, and you want the product of Apple. And if you do those three things, you will be enchanting, and you will change people's hearts, minds, and actions, and you will change the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. I genuinely enchanted. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. Guy's going to have a book signing right now downstairs uh, on the second floor in the bookstore right outside the expo, and we'll see you back here this evening for Jeffrey Cole. Thank you. <laughs>